or maybe your first time in a while. If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. journey and welcome to worship. We're delighted that you're with us today, whether you're with us on Zoom or Facebook. If you're a first time worshiper with us, a special welcome to you. We're absolutely delighted that you're here with us on this day. So we just want to remind you that if you're on Facebook at any point during the service, um, we invite you to use the comment section. That's a way you kind of greet one another, let people know that you're here, put in your comments and your feedback and participate in that way. If you're on Zoom, the same can be said for the chat section. So feel free to put chats in there, chat with each other um, via the chat room. And we're just um, glad that you're all here. We thank our Facebook greeter. Um, Cindy is our Facebook greeter and our Zoom greeter is Marcy and our worship assistant today is Holly. So we thank you all for helping us um, help put this worship together and make it happen. So we are in this series on the Gospel of Matthew, um, which we have been entitling Walk With Me. So what we've been doing through this series is walking with Jesus as he teaches, as he heals and performs miracles, um, and kind of watching him as he walks through all aspects of life, because that's the way we learn, um, by following his example. So the last few weeks, we have been dealing with some of the parables of Jesus, um, and most of the time, Jesus does um, the parable thing in response to questions that he receives from either his followers or more and more as we get to the later part of Matthew, it's questions from the opposition, particularly questions um, that are trying, they're trying to entrap him um, and make him look bad. And so we can probably all relate to that in this election season, right? So today we're going to go with parables, a parable. Actually, it's three parables strung together. That's why it seems a little bit disjointed at times with this parable. It's like, woo, grace, like, punishment. It's, it's a little weird. We're going to unpack that together. Um, and I just want us to think, um, talk a little bit about, about weddings, okay, as we begin our worship. So we all know that weddings in the midst of COVID have been, for the most part, absent. Um, and those few weddings that have occurred um, during the last few months have been drastically altered. People used to, you know, plan big events, and now they're just small, intimate affairs with maybe one or two win witnesses and everybody wearing masks. So what I want you to do is to kind of go back in time and remember, remember um, the way that things used to be when it came to wedding. Um, remember the good old days when we used to gather hundreds and hundreds of people in churches and in banquet halls. And remember months ago, it seems like years ago, when we would kind of all hug and kiss at weddings, we would be close with one another, we would share food at a wedding. There were times, sometimes buffets, do you remember buffets? Um, and then we would, you know, kind of end by dancing the night away closely, partying together. Um, so think back to that time. 
Um, and think particularly of the wedding that you have been invited to, or even perhaps the weddings that you have helped plan, maybe your own wedding or the wedding of a child or someone, a friend, something you helped out with. So think back to that particular wedding. Do you have one in your mind? You may want to put it in the comment or the chat section. What made it stand out? Like I have some memorable weddings. Um, I do literally, you know, I've done hundreds and hundreds of weddings over my career. Um, but I have this kind of top 10 list of weddings that stand out for me. What makes a wedding stand out for you? What is it that you remember most about that particular wedding? So put that in the comment section, put it in the chat section. We're going to look today at Jesus' parable, and it says parable on the screen, but it's really parables. There are three parables strung together in a very interesting, crazy kind of way. Um, and these are parables that have a lot of wedding drama in them. Um, and we're going to see what Jesus has to say about weddings and wedding etiquette and particularly the response of wedding guests. So as we prepare to do that and think and reflect on weddings, um, Holly's going to get us started with our opening words, our call to worship and our opening prayer. As always, your part's in yellow. Good morning. The um, join me in our call to worship, please. Praise the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. For God is good and their steadfast love endures forever. May we never forget the Lord our God, but seek after God's justice that we may know their glory. Let us worship the Lord. We'll do so by entering into our opening prayer. Lord God, you invite one and all, so here we are. You make space for us, whoever and wherever we are. We may feel your welcome and extend that same grace to others. Wherever we have been, whatever brings us to this act of worship, may we experience encounter with you, O living God, and may that encounter transform our lives. Bye. 
the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to as you are before your God. Come, 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 just as you are, So before I have Holly read our sacred story for the day, I just want to kind of set the stage um, and have you do a little reflection on excuses. We all have excuses for um, why we maybe from time to time don't do things or don't want to engage in things or don't want to, um, you know, do what maybe other people expect. They may be good excuses, bad excuses, whatever. I'm not here to judge. I want you to just talk, think today um, for just a moment. You can put it in the com comment section or the chat section if you don't, you feel like confession is good for the soul. But what is the biggest tale that you have ever told to use as an excuse for something that you were supposed to do? Um, an excuse for maybe, you know, not cleaning your room as a child or for not taking your pet out for a walk, for not doing your homework or completing an assignment in high school or college, um, why you've been late getting home or why you were late uh, meeting a friend for lunch. What's the biggest tale that you have ever told as an excuse for not doing something? And the more ridiculous, the better. I think this is kind of a, a funny little exercise for us. And I want you to kind of hold that in your mind as you hear this story that Holly's going to share with us today, a sacred story from Matthew 22. And the reading is from Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Jesus responded by telling still more stories. God's kingdom, he said, is like a king who threw a wedding banquet for his son. He, went, he sent out servants to call in all the invited guests, and they wouldn't come. He sent out another round of servants, instructing them to tell the guests, look, everything is on the table. The prime rib is, all, is ready for carving. Come to the feast. They only shrugged their shoulders and went off, one to eat his garden, another to work in his shop. The rest, with nothing better to do, beat up on the messengers and then killed them. The king was outraged and sent his soldiers to destroy those thugs and level their city. Then he told his servants, we have a wedding banquet all prepared, but no guests. The ones I invited weren't up to it. Go out into the busiest intersections in town and invite everyone you find to the banquet. The servants went out on the streets and rounded up everyone they laid eyes on, good and bad regardless. And so the banquet was on, every place filled. When the king entered and looked over the scene, he spotted a man who wasn't properly dressed. He said to him, friend, how dare you come in here looking like that? The man was speechless. Then the king told his servants, get him out of here fast, tie him up and ship him to hell and make sure he doesn't get back in. That's what I mean when I say many get invited, only a few make it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
So I have a lot of different kinds of books on my bookshelf as a pastor, lots and lots of Bibles, lots and lots of kind of um, Bible interpretation books that help me in that way. Um, among all of those books is this book, Emily Post's Wedding Etiquette, subtitled Cherished Traditions and Contemporary Ideas for a Joyous Celebration. It's come in handy over the years because like I said, I literally have done hundreds and hundreds of weddings over my career. And oftentimes in the pre-marriage counseling and in planning, helping brides and grooms and, and all sorts of people plan for their ceremony, um, they have questions about what the proper way to do things is. So this book, you know, it's 400 pages of everything you wanted to know about a wedding from the actual moment of engagement through all of the expenses, who pays for what, lots of questions about that, and some of the legalities, like what you need to do. There's chapters on attendance, the flowers, the music, the pictures, planning the ceremony, the most important part, the exchange of the I do's, and right up until the honeymoon. It's, it's all in the book. My gosh, so much information. And there in chapter six, there is a whole 46 pages devoted to what Emily calls invitation etiquette. The style of the invitation, the wording of the invitation, all about the envelopes, you know, there's multiple envelopes when you send out a wedding invitation. What should be inserted, that RSVP card, how they should be stocked, how they should, you know, appear when you open the envelope for the, you know, the greatest impact for people. Invitation do's and a lot of invitation don'ts. So when I come to this story, the sacred story that Jesus shares, or actually, as I said, three different sacred stories, um, I have to wonder about what Emily Post would say about the parables that Jesus describes in Matthew 22, how um, those parables would unpack in Emily's mind. Because you got to ask the question, where did things go wrong? How could things be so messed up? Was it something that the king did? Did he send out his invitations in the wrong way? Perhaps he didn't use the proper stationery. Perhaps they weren't addressed correctly, or maybe they didn't include that self-addressed response card. And then I got to have even more questions about the invited guests. Like, what the heck is up with them? They're invited to what is undoubtedly the wedding of the year. And the vast majority of them are no-shows. Can't a guest, can a, can a guest change their mind on the day of the wedding? Isn't that just downright rude? Now I have to like put a little footnote in here. I've noticed this trend in the last few years. More and more weddings that I'm a part of when you get to the reception, there's not just simply an empty chair here and there at the reception. Sometimes there are whole empty tables. And I hear the frustrations of people participating and trying to plan weddings when they're like, people don't RSVP anymore. They don't RSVP online. They don't send back their response card. And usually brides and grooms and mothers and fathers end up calling the vast majority of guests the week before the wedding to ask them if they're coming so they can place a food order. So I kind of wonder, though, what's happening in this mess? in this mess of a wedding. What would Emily say? And, and why is it that Jesus is telling this story? What, what can we learn, if anything, from this parable yet today? Actually, we kind of need to step back from it a little bit. The parable assumes that we understand the customs of the time something that you won't read about in Emily Post because it goes back to the days of Jesus. And particularly, it has to do with this thing of, called a double invitation. Indeed, 
it appears that according to the social customs of the time, the king has indeed done everything right. He has followed the rules down to the finest detail. Back in Jesus' time, the first invitation for a wedding is sent far in advance, telling people in essence to hold the date. We have those things, right? We have the little save the date cards. I've been getting them for weddings that I participate in for a number of years. People wanna get it on people's calendar. The difference is in Jesus' time, that first invitation, that save the date card, would come with an RSVP. And so people would at that moment of the first invitation say, yep, I'm going to be there. Count us in. We wouldn't miss this for the whole world. And then in Jesus' time, this would kind of be the betrothal time. Remember, Mary and Joseph were betrothed when she found out that she was pregnant. It's kind of more of a, a legal thing than engagement. Betrothal is actually more like a marriage. They are legally bound to one another. It's just that time when you're kind of working out all the details between the two families. Because remember, there's exchange of property anytime um, two people come together in Jesus' day. So in Jesus' day, this would have been followed, this first invitation would have been followed by this time where there's legalities being worked out, planning being done. And then when all of the arrangements were made, and everybody has signed the contract on the dotted line, and when they were actually ready to declare that all the exchanges of property have actually happened, then they would send the second invitation. The second invitation would simply say, okay, come now. Come now because everything's ready. The feast has been prepared. As our translation um, states, the prime rib is on the table ready to be carved. And people already had it in their books, in their appointment calendars. So it was simply a like, come now. And people under normal circumstances would then arrive. The lavish banquet has been prepared. That part, not so shocking. Extravagance on behalf of the king, of course he'd throw a wild and good party. That is not unfamiliar. And in this parable, if God is like the king or like the father, we understand God's graciousness and extravagance and over the top um, love and um, festivities planned for each of us. What's shocking, the surprise is the level of indifference displayed by the guests. What's shocking is their lavish, is their response, their reaction to this lavish welcome. It's not like they have legit kind of excuses. In fact, our interpretation. I like Eugene Peterson for declaring um, that, hey, you know, they kind of shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, I have a garden to weed. I have this work to do. Um, it's pretty much an example of anything that could be done any other given day. They are simply making excuses and they're not particularly good excuses. And remember, this is a royal wedding a big event. Like you don't decline an invitation when Harry and Meghan send out a wedding invitation for you to attend, right? And in fact, we read in the stories, the parables that Jesus tells, that some guests actually make light of it. And then there's other guests who take this to a whole new level. I'm telling you, this is the big surprise. They seize the messengers they kill the messengers, they kill the ones delivering the invitation. And it's like the second parable like kind of is so bizarre. We don't really understand it because all of a sudden things were all about grace and love and invitation and, and having a big party. And then it turns dark, dark, really dark, really fast. Now, I think some of that is simply Matthew's use of hyperbole. And remember like a couple of weeks ago when we talked about, you know, somebody owing a debt of a gazillion dollars, that's kind of like it. Matthew sometimes overstates things. 
particularly when it talks, when he's talking about empire and those who have abused the invitation and the grace that God has given to them. He overstates it and he says, listen, this is their response. This is indeed what they have done. And so it all sets this stage for, I think, what perhaps is the most shocking part of the story, the part that comes next. Because what does the rich man, the, the king, the father do? He decides he's going to invite more guests. But rather than inviting more guests from the same social circle as the original guests, the host turns to the streets of the city, beginning with the poor, those who are lame, those who are blind, we read, and the very transients on the public roads and the byways and the intersections of the city. And then Matthew paints for us, going back to kind of the first parable, this scene with new guests who must have been a little bit on the surprising side. Because some of those who were perceived or presumed to be kind of the riffraff of life are now on the inside. And some of the fine upstanding citizens are on the outs. And then inside this wedding banquet, inside the reception hall, inside the place where the ceremony is taking place, it's a mix. It's the good, quote, and the bad, quote, sitting next to each other, people who know which fork to use, sitting next to the people who don't even own a fork. And all of this makes heads turn, right? It's shocking. It like, whoa, what is going on here? Seems like Jesus is turning upside, everything upside down again and kind of reframing yet another tradition and seems to be inviting us to see things in a new light. In the UCC, in the United Church of Christ, we know this as an extravagant welcome. We know it as this, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We get that, right? Journey knows that phrase. We have it on t-shirts. We have it on all sorts of mugs and stuff. And we say it and we hear it regularly. So that part is not so surprising for us. But I think what I would invite us to see today is the urgency of the matter for the king. He is, you see, determined to have people at the banquet. He will. He will have full tables. His will is for new relationships to be built. His will is for community. His will is for connection. And he will not stop until that goal is reached. He will not stop until the tables are full. He will not stop until everyone is included. It is a great lesson, continues to be a great lesson for us when it comes to outreach and hospitality and who it is that we invite into our family of faith and the urgency we should have about that. But it is also a picture for us of mission and service and how we go out into the byways and the highways and the intersections of the city and meet people there, how we embrace them and how it is that we invite them in to our lives of privilege and to share what we have. Now I recognize that this is an extraordinary challenge in this time of COVID. We don't have a building in which to invite people into, right? It's a struggle. And we talked about this a little bit in our book study this week. Like, how is it that we invite people to join us on Zoom and Facebook? And how is it that we even connect with each other? 
you know, I'm realizing like Zoom and Facebook are not necessarily everybody's thing. And sometimes people drift away from those connections. And it is hard to get people to come to the festivities and get people to come to the table, to come to the banquet. But the parable invites us to keep offering those invitations to keep welcoming people, to find new ways to reach out, new ways of connecting with one another. Because we live in a story, a sacred story, a time where everybody is welcome and the need is more urgent than ever. So I invite you to reflect on that as we share our prayer of response. Lord God, we thank you that you invite us to a party like none we have ever been to. A party where we do not have to dress up to fit in, a party where all we need to do is to bring ourselves. A party where no one is left out, a party that from the moment we arrive challenges us to step up and step out, noticing and caring, inspiring and encouraging, making a difference by playing our part, being the unique individuals you create us to be, pooling our resources to change the world, all in your name. Amen. So this is the part in our worship when we would normally pass that offering basket around. So we're symbolically doing that at this moment and we invite you to give um, your offering. You can obviously do that, continue to do that online, mail it to our post office box in Slingerlands, or if it's easiest for you, just drop it in my mailbox here at home. And once again, we thank all of you who have continued to support all the work that we do here at Journey in uh, bringing hope to not just our faith community, but to the wider world. Um, and as we consider our gifts, um, I invite you to enjoy this song. The, the band had some problems this week with um, power. Most of our band did not have power. So we're just going to enjoy a video version of a song called Tis a Gift to be Simple. Um, and hey, you know what? If you're feeling like it, stand up and do a little dance because this is an upbeat, peppy tune.
you all to join me in our prayer of dedication for our gifts. May we always be willing, O oh God, to use all that you have given us to transform the world with your peace and your joy. Generous God, make us generous too, blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And this is the time in our worship when we would normally light some candles and have you all share your joys and your concerns. So once again, I invite you, if you have either a joy, something good that's happened to you this past week, or a concern, something that you want us to pray for, for you or a family member or a friend or a situation, even in our wider world, um, please feel free to put those in the comment section on Facebook or in the chat section on the Zoom. Or if you you prefer just email those to me at journeyucc at gmail or you can even text them um, via our cell phone. So I would just like to take a moment to light some prayer candles just for some of our general concerns. We light this candle for all those who have lost loved ones during this time. We light this candle for all those who are still sick and recovering. We light this candle for all who are feeling alone and isolated. We light this candle for those who are struggling for the basic necessities of life. We light this candle for those who are treated unfairly simply because of the color of their skin. We light this candle for those who are enslaved by all of the injustices in our world. We light this candle for those who are afraid this day and feel no hope or joy and finally, we light this candle for all of those things that we offer up silently because they are so precious. And then I'll invite you to join me is, as we pray together um, using this prayer. Inclusive God, we ask on this day, why is your world so divided? Why, oh God, are we so binary? We think of good or evil, black or white, male or female, straight or gay, rich or poor, young or old. We seem incapable of seeing the whole colorful spectrum that you created. And each of us as created in your image. We have a compulsion to label and to categorize, to separate and demonize anything that saves us having to own one another as family and justifies us with holding all that we feel we have earned. While we are busy hoarding, your children continue to suffer. And oftentimes we are too busy to notice and far less make a difference. Lord, give us wider arms and bigger hearts and greater understanding to know that sharing what we have will not diminish us. You bless us so that we might bless others. So we pray for worlds to end. And we ask that we may refuse to invest 
in all that causes destruction. We pray for homes for the homeless and food for the hungry, and may we be willing to share the space and the wealth that we hold so tightly. Pry open our hands and our hearts to care and to share freely. Heal the blindness that prevents us from seeing and our muteness that prevents us from speaking out against injustice wherever it is found and give us wisdom to know how to change things for good, how to empower others to enable change as well. Inclusive God, inspire us to be inclusive too. Amen. So we have some announcements as we move forward into a new week. Um, a reminder that hopefully you're by now you're getting those Zoom links every Monday in an email along with a guided meditation and a children and worship, worship story. Um, if you're not getting those emails, of course, let us know about that. And we do invite you, we've added some new dates um, right through the end of the year for worship assistants and virtual greeters. And we encourage you, we need you now more than ever um, to be a welcoming presence and to assist us with our worship online for the rest of the year. So take a click and uh, go ahead and sign up for that this week. Um, Monday through Friday, we remind you that we have those three minute meditations that appear on Facebook and Instagram. Tuesday, we will continue our book study group on Faithful Resistance. Even if you haven't joined us in the past, it's totally open to anybody who wants to join us moving forward. So that is Tuesday at 7.30 via Zoom. Leadership team has been rescheduled because of the power outage. So we will meet this Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Also via Zoom. The Zoom link stays the same, my friends. So join us for leadership team Wednesday at 7. This week, we have two things on Thursday. Cindy will be cooking um, some hibachi style fried rice. Um, and so if you want to if you want to join us, um, go ahead and do that. The Zoom link will be included along with the recipe. So if you want um, to join us, we ask that you kind of get the ingredients ahead of time and prep them ahead of time and be ready to roll with us Thursday at 530. And then also on Thursday, um, the WISE Task Force will have our second meeting from 7.30 to 8.30. The Zoom link will be included on Monday as well. For those of you who are interested in joining our Hudson Mohawk Association meeting, um, that will be Saturday also via Zoom. I'll include that link as well on Monday. And it's a good meeting. Um, I mean, we have a short business meeting this time, but also uh, Marsha Williams and Gary Smith will be leading us on a conversation about race. So if you want to be a part of that, we invite you to join us. Our October collection of the month is our college care packages for um, our students who are studying. And um, so just at this point, start collecting those items. And then later this month, we'll have you drop them off at my house um, when I am ready um, to uh, ship those out. Don't want them sitting out in my driveway for too long. And I um, want to save to have you save the date, October 29. We will also have another cooking opportunity. Woohoo! Um, Joe will be um, showing us how to make his kielbasa cheddar soup. So save that date. We'll get you the Zoom later for that. And then of course, if you have any plan that you think might be good in helping us connect with each other, kind of following the theme of our sermon today, our message today, um, and, and inviting and connecting with others, we really need to hear from you. If you can do something in Zoom, you wanna do something in person, just let me know and I'll help you get that scheduled and work out the details for all of that. So we leave it up to you to, to kind of be creative and get those events going. All right, I want to invite you to hear now these words of blessing and sending. Each time we meet, God throws a party. God is glad that we came, delighted that we made the effort. Remember, remember that you are God's special guests. Remember this as we leave our time together. God the Creator, Jesus the Son, the Spirit our guide, makes time for us each and every day. Amen.
to invite you to join in our closing song, Jesus Lead On. that you joined us for today. We hope that you have a blessed week. If you're on Facebook, we will catch you next week at this time. If you're on Zoom, uh, here's an invitation for you to unmute yourselves and chat amongst yourselves. Have a good week. So Sandy, I went to the doctor again.